Here's a scenario. You're using your favorite video editing software, it crashes, and you load it back up and it kindly asks you if you want to resume where you left off. This particular scenario shares something in common with most applications we all use on a daily basis, serialization. Today we're going to look at a specific form of serialization. I'm going to show how it works and then I'm going to show how we can use it to help create a small pixel art editor from scratch. This is game engineering. As we saw in our previous example, almost all applications employ some form of serialization, whether it's for saving game state, saving or loading assets like textures, materials, or shaders, or syncing data across a network for multiple people. First, let's define some terms so we're all on the same page. Binary serialization involves taking some arbitrary set of structured data and then transforming that data into a homogeneous structured stream of bytes. All right, so let's look at how to implement a custom serialization mechanism. We're going to implement something called a byte buffer. If you're familiar with higher level languages like Java or C Sharp, this should be very familiar to you. If not, then this is how a basic byte buffer is set up and works. What we'll do is we'll systematically break complex structures apart and then write their individual properties into the buffer. Then, upon request, we can read back out the same data to reconstruct these objects in the future. All right, so this sounds great, but how is this done? Let's look at this texture as an example. Here we have a 2D image with a width and a height of four pixels. Each pixel of the image is comprised of data for each channel, depending on the number of components for that image. Given this description, we can break this texture down into a structure made up of these properties. We'll have a width, that'll be four bytes. We'll have height, which will also be four bytes. We'll have a number of components per pixel. And then we'll have a void pointer, which will just be an array of all of our pixel data that we'll use. When serializing our texture, we'll convert each of its properties into a stream of byte information. And then one by one, we'll add them into our byte buffer. We can now do any number of things with the data, including saving to disk. To reconstruct our object, we just need to reverse the process and then read back our data in a very specific way. First, we'll ask for the first four bytes to get our textures width. Then we'll ask for another four bytes for the height and another four bytes for the number of components per pixel. And finally, using all this information, we can ask for a bulk read for all the pixel data using this formula for the byte size that needs to be read. And with that, our texture can be fully reconstructed at runtime. Let's take a quick look at some code. The two most important functions for a byte buffer will be a generic read and write. For the write function, we'll pass the type in, then we'll grab the size of that type in bytes, and then by doing some simple casts, we can place the data into our buffer. Internally, the byte buffer will be responsible for allocating and reallocating its storage to keep up with the requested size changes. These are simple heap allocations in this case, but any form of allocation scheme would work. The read function will be more or less the same. The only difference is we'll pass in the type and then a pointer to the place in memory where we want to place a copy of that data. All right, so here's the plan. Let's create a small pixel art editor. It won't be the next Photoshop, but for this we should have some basic functionality working. We'll define a 2D texture on the CPU and then we'll use that to push data onto the GPU each frame. For a quick GUI solution, I'm using the nuclear library. It's a fantastic header-only library, and it's especially great for tools like this. It takes just a bit of code to get it up and running, and we'll have the ability for the user to be able to choose their paint color, as well as the ability to add various buttons for things. Saving our image will be just like the example we showed before. We'll write out the width, then the height, and then the pixel data into our byte buffer. Once we have all that written, the user can save the image to disk with a custom location. For this demo, the extension .pix will be used as the custom file format, although we could have chosen anything. Loading will require us to read the data back from file in the order we placed it. So first we'll read the width, and then our height, and then finally all the pixel data. Not being able to undo mistakes in a paint program quickly gets annoying, so undo redo functionality is important. Here's how we're going to implement it. Our paint program will store two additional byte buffers for the duration of the program, one for undo actions and then one for redo actions. When the user starts painting, this is what will happen. 
The program will start recording an action into the undo buffer. An action will be stored like this in memory. We'll have an opcode, and then we'll have a series of action structs, which will be explained later. And then we'll have the full size of all the recorded action data. The undo system works as a sort of virtual machine or a bytecode interpreter. The program will look at the current position of the undo buffer data. It'll grab the overall size of the data and then walk itself back to the beginning of the action. Using some simple division to grab the total number of actions written into this buffer, we can now iterate through and read each action to reverse them. After we're done with this undo buffer, we'll set our undo position manually, and then we'll add the entire stream of actions into the redo buffer for later use. Redoing an action from the redo buffer works exactly the same as the undo, it's just going to be in reverse order. Now that this overview has been given, we need to define what an action is. Currently, the system has two opcodes, one for writing individual pixel data, and then one for clearing the entire canvas. Let's just focus on the first one. We'll have an action corresponding directly to that op. But this is where some careful consideration needs to happen. For undo and redo, we need to know how to go back and forth between two disjointed states. So naively, we could write out our entire texture twice, what all the pixel data used to be, and then what it changed into. We could also naively write out this data every frame that the mouse is down. If we did this, here's what the data sizes would be for an image that's 128 by 128 pixels in size. Now understandably, RAM is cheap, but I think most of us would agree we can do a lot better. So instead of writing out each image fully, we could simply write out individual pixels that have changed. And instead of writing every frame that the mouse is down, we could start recording while the mouse is down, and then end the recording when the mouse is released to complete the action. With those changes, here's what the data comes to. We're getting better, but we can go even smaller. If we think about what a paint operation is doing, we're just mutating one state into another via some homogeneous transformation. We're just changing pixel information between states. This means if we know our original state, we can simply record how this data changes instead of the data itself. Using this information, we can then reconstruct the actual state in our undo-redo functions. This is a process called delta compression, and it'll certainly come up again in future videos. So now, our actions can be transformed into this final form. We'll have the RGBA delta values encoded. These values go from a positive 0 to 255 because they're unsigned. And our range of possible values needs to go either positive or negative, since you can either add or subtract from a channel. So we'll also need to store another byte for the signs of our operations, and then we'll pack each sign into that. After all of this, we've cut down our original command to just 7 bytes. Changing an entire image from one color to another, which is now our worst case scenario, will be just this large. And that wraps it up.